So hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm here with Duke biology professors Steve Haas and Greg Ray for a bit of behind the scenes discussion of some of the work that has helped guide our approach to COVID management on campus. So Steve and Greg, you either volunteered or were drafted to the cause, but either way, uh, you stepped up to lead the modeling and sequencing work that has been a crucial part of our strategy to control COVID on ca campus for more than a year now. So today I'd like to focus in particular on how your work has helped guide our decision-making related to the semester, as well as what we've learned this semester uh, from viral sequencing. So let's start a little bit with the testing and I'll start with you, Steve. Um, so Duke decided much earlier than other schools that we would continue testing all students this fall. So what made you recommend continued testing for all students, even those who are fully vaccinated? Yeah, it's a great question. So early on in, in June, the CDC came out and made uh, set some guidelines for universities. And included in those guidelines were that fully vaccinated populations of students did not need to do surveillance testing or social distancing or masking. Um, you know, none of the mitigations that, that we had uh, used so effectively in the year before. And, and so we actually modeled that uh, by fitting our model parameters to data from last year. And at the levels of uh, vaccine efficiency for preventing transmission, which at the time was about 90%, uh, we saw that without surveillance testing, you did just about as good as surveillance testing. And I think this was uh, the foundation for these kinds of decisions. What bothered us at the time were reports coming out of a number of, of countries that the vaccine efficiency against some of the variants, at that time alpha and beta, was not at the 90%, but at a diminished rate. And as well, we were starting to see delta uh, um, really taking hold in India and other places. And there were also reports that that that, that variant might have the capability to, uh, to be resistant to vaccine-induced immunity. And so we did another modeling exercise and asked what happens if we reduce, you know, go through the same exercise, but reduce the vaccine efficiency to 75% or 50%. And what we saw in those exercises is that, that there were uh, substantial numbers of infections that occurred in a vaccinated population, especially if we weren't testing. And so, uh, it was this caution that we had about the potential loss of uh, vaccine efficiency against the variants that led us to suggest that we were going to keep testing uh, in the fall. Yeah, and if I remember from looking at your data, there was also an impact of the number of contacts the average student would have this year compared to last year, given things being much more open and the, the capability of transmission going up. Yeah, 100%. We modeled that as well and turned the dials in the model because we expected if we took masks off, there would be many more uh, opportunities for transmission. Uh, and as well, the density on campus is, is much higher this year because we have more students back. So all of these things kind of led us to think that uh, we should probably start testing at the beginning and we could uh, we could scale that back if we didn't need it. So as you're sort of looking at uh, these data in real time, how do you adjust who's going to get tested and when? You know, it, it, there's different sectors, there's different parts of the, the uh, areas of the campus and also different populations of students. That's right. And so I think testing in gen general strategy is to apply uh, the most testing to groups that are in congregate living uh, settings, like our undergraduates in dormitories. Uh, and so we set baseline levels for testing you know, once a week. Uh, right now we're twice a week for our undergraduates on campus. And then we have the ability, and we're looking at the data um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, we look at it as it comes out hourly. And if there's a particular group, let's say we had three or four cases in a particular dorm, we might increase the number of tests we push at that dorm uh, just to make sure that we're catching everything if there, is a, if there is a surge in that place. So we look geospatially at where, where students are living, uh, social living groups that we might see, uh, you know, classrooms, all, all kinds of things that we're looking for signals of transmission that we might push more tests to to make sure we're catching everything. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I think, you know, one thing that's 
it's not maybe absolutely unique, but it's certainly within a very small group of peers, uh, we're sequencing every viral sample uh, from individuals who test positive for COVID in our uh, surveillance system. So maybe Greg, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and you know what, what you've learned from the sequencing? Sure, yeah. So you, know, you might ask, why would you sequence every single sample? Aren't you seeing the same thing over and over again? And when we started this, that, that was an open question, but what we've learned is that almost every time the virus transmits and goes through a person and reproduces and then goes on to the next person, that there's a genetic change. And we can use those genetic changes to learn about the genealogy of the strains of viruses that are circulating on campus and even to understand something about the patterns of transmission. That has been really useful for thinking about how we, how we sort of understand the way in which the virus moves around and, and moves from person to person. No, that's interesting. And presumably also it would be, um, we'd get an early warning system if there were really a concerning variant uh, that were to emerge. Certainly, yeah. And we, I mean, it was quite remarkable uh, to watch the variants sort of come in in successive waves over the, over the weeks of, of this year. So when, when we were in the fall of last year, most of what was circulating was very similar to what you might call the original strain. And then over the winter, we began to see um, some of the California strain and the alpha strain, beta strain come on. And, and then about July of this year, we saw the first Delta. And within a couple of weeks, it became almost 100%. So this just been almost a displacement of wave after wave of strain coming in. Um, but you're right, if a, if a new concerning variant were to appear somewhere, we would, we would almost immediately know when it shows up on campus. No, that's great. So, you know, one thing I think that uh, our faculty and students have, have all been, you know, concerned about is really how we know where infections are, are, are occurring. You know, we have said over and over again, and our peers have said that we have not seen classroom transmission, particularly in our setting where, first of all, we have such a high level of vaccination now, but also even going back last year before vaccination, because everyone in the classroom is masked. But Maybe you, uh, both Steve and Greg, maybe you can tell us a little bit more how contact tracing and sequencing are actually contributing to identifying uh, the sources of infection and how this sort of bolsters our conclusion that we're not seeing classroom transmission and how it tells us a little bit about where our major transmissions are actually occurring. <laughs> sure, I think may maybe I could speak to the data part and Steve could speak to the uh patterns of transmission part that comes with the contact tracing that I think one of the things that's helpful to understand here is that that the virus in almost every individual we see on campus has a different sequence. It's almost like it's got its own fingerprint. And indeed, most of the time when we when we get a batch of samples to sequence, every single individual has a unique viral sequence in, in, in that they're carrying. And those sequences are not even right next to each other, if you will. They don't differ by one or two positions. They might differ by 10 or 20 or even 30 positions. Wow. Um, so that means that, in, in fact, it actually stands out when we see two samples that have a very, very similar or pot potentially identical sequence. Those are the cases that are probably direct transmission, uh, either between those two individuals or perhaps a third unknown individual that directly transmitted to them. But those are the exceptional cases. And every now and then, so, so most of the time, it seems like there's not campus transmission happening. Every now and then we see a cluster of really similar sequences. And Steve, why don't you uh, pick up on that and, and explain what happens when we send those back to you? Right, so, so, uh, so, so sequencing data has been very uh, helpful in putting it together with contact tracing data where um, and contact tracers are using interviews and other kinds of information about those that are infected to ask, hey, what's the most likely mode of, of transmission? And so uh, what we've learned in, in these cases where we see uh, uh, for individuals with highly similar sequences and, and sometimes identical is the contact tracing data actually 
fits with that. And they all, they in at least one case, have reported being at a gathering at an off-campus establishment. So, so I think, uh, so the, the contact tracing data that's been collected since the start of the pandemic uh, is very highly complementary to the sequence data that Greg is discussing, and both are telling the same story. And that is that most of the infection we see on campus probably comes from uh, students or uh, other individuals being infected while off campus and not really student to student um, uh, infections on campus. Yeah, and I think a lot of this has guided our policy, for instance, around dining. I think if we look, uh, or food at meetings, et cetera, I think when we look through contact tracing, we're actually getting the information that it's mostly in unmasked situations, almost mm -hmm. entirely with eating and drinking and the sort of certainly the mass transmission events that we can see through sequencing bolster that conclusion. But even if we look at, you know, smaller clusters, presumably sequence relatedness, you can say these are these are social events by and large. Um, so, you know, this is great. I think uh, folks can see this almost like as a movie trailer teaser because uh, uh, Steve and some other colleagues uh, did a, a talk at Academic Council this week, delving into a lot of the data, some of the sequencing data that Greg has generated uh, and complemented by work by uh, Tom Denny and Cam Wolf, um, and then Kyle Cavanaugh sort of as uh, uh, over, an overview. So I think uh, probably in another week or so, we'll be releasing that video to the whole campus and I urge folks to watch it. And I hope that, that folks found this uh, uh, informative just in terms of these specific questions of how we're using uh, these data. So thank you again for all your work and uh, thanks for uh, the conversation today. Thanks, Sally.